Welcome, I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate. Later on the program, a look at genetically modified foods. But first, let's talk a little bit about the clean power plan. And the United States Supreme Court said, no, not yet, not until we adjudicate it. Our governor, Hickenlooper, says, I don't care, I'm going to do it anyway. From the Gazette down in the Springs, Wayne Logason, good to see you again. Thanks, good to be here. And from my neck of the woods, and this is the best name ever, John Golden Dubois from the Western Resource Advocates. I think I got all that right. You got it all right. Thanks Tell for people me. about your organization. Sure, Western Resource Advocates is an organization that's worked for 27 years to protect land, air, and water in seven western states. We work to reduce the effects of climate change, to ensure that we move towards a clean energy economy, to protect western rivers like the Colorado River Basin, and to protect iconic landscapes across the West. Yeah, all the stuff I hate. That's Water, right. air, we don't need any. But all I, the reasons I, that you live in Colorado. That's not the reason. I live here because of Tabor. That's why I live here. Anyway, we'll go someplace else. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the Supreme Court decision. This decision uh, before Scalia's death uh, said to the EPA, you're going to stop this. We don't know if it's constitutional or not, but we're going to stop it until after it's fully adjudicated and we get a, get a look at it. This was huge. The court haven't done this since Truman was president. How big was that? Well, it's huge, as you said, and lots of congratulations to Colorado Attorney General Cynthia Kaufman for her substantial role in this. The decision is big because, first of all, prior to the death of Antonin Scalia, it pretty much assured how the vote was going to go on the overall lawsuit. But more important was the fact for them to make this decision, this unprecedented, almost unprecedented decision. They had to determine that going forward with the Clean Power Plan would pose substantial harm to the states and the people in those states. And so not only did they decide that they would probably strike the whole thing down, they said if they didn't strike it down, if they didn't stop it for now until they could do that, it would cause substantial harm. What is that substantial harm? That substantial harm is enormous spikes in electric rates for people who can least afford it. Uh, it means poverty. I mean, when you're talking about uh, farmers who are dealing with uh, corn prices that are cut in half all of a sudden, and you're dealing with low-income households, you know, with incomes of $30,000 a year and below, this is huge. Let me talk a little bit, before we get into whether the idea of this clean power plan, whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, let me just ask you about the legality of it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I think the EPA went way out of its bounds, and I think the Supreme Court agreed that this is something that uh, they don't have, have the authority to do. Do you feel differently, and if you, if you do, would you feel differently if they went in a completely opposite direction? Yeah, I definitely I mean, feel And different. I'm just talking about, about the legality, not, not whether right. it's a good, good for the environment, bad for the environment. Yeah, I, I definitely think that the Clean Power Plan will ultimately be upheld as legal. There are a couple things that are important to give context in this case. First is that in 2014, the Supreme Court said that indeed the EPA does have the right to regulate carbon pollution, and EPA, in fact, has a mandate to do that. What the Supreme Court did, I would characterize very differently. I would say they hit pause to get a deeper understanding of what's happened and whether or not there will be harm. States, some states have made claims that there will be. But remember, 20 states, 13 utilities across the country are all saying, we're moving ahead with the Clean Power Plan, not only because we think it's legal, but because we think Let it's the right Let me jump on policy. one thing you said, though. You said, I think oh, that this will be proved legal. Well, that certainly wasn't the case for the EPA mercury rules that uh, went through, and uh, the head of the EPA, when they got uh, rebuffed by the Supreme Court, saying, no, those, you don't have the power to those rules, she said, that's okay. We've already forced the compliance because it takes years to get to the Supreme through the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. By that point, all the utilities had to already comply with that regulation. By the time they said the Supreme Court said, "No, this is unconstitutional," well, the damage was already done, or in your case, the success was already had. So, when you say that the Supreme Court is going to find the Clean Power Plan constitutional, well, they didn't do that with the mercury regulations. And this is very similar. I'd say it's different. In fact. You know, that 2014 decision is pretty important in this larger context when the Supreme Court said that, yes, EPA does have the authority to regulate carbon pollution. So I think that sets up this conversation quite differently. And by hitting pause and giving the states 
that are opposed to the Clean Power Plan an opportunity to make that case. I, I think all that does really is it delays action that we need to take. And they're actions that, by the way, uh, will strengthen our economy. They are actions that will reduce climate pollution. They're actions that will clean up our air. They will increase better health, health outcomes and they will reduce health care costs. All those things are no-brainers that we should be pursuing anyway. Damn, that sounds good. It's going to help the economy. Come on, well, Wayne. It's, it's, it's going to help health care costs. I suppose you know, it helps is... the economy if you're on the receiving end of the redistribution scheme. It doesn't help the economy if you're a ratepayer on the eastern plains of Colorado and you're still trying to pay off the last power plant that was built and it gets shut down and you have to continue paying on that while you pay for new so-called renewables assets and consider that the clean power plan doesn't count. It doesn't give you credit for the very many assets that you've already built, In other such words, as the hundreds of wind turbines that one finds on the eastern plains of Colorado. Those don't count toward your ability to meet this very high threshold that the federal government wants to impose let me see if I, let me see if I understand on the state. states. I mean, Colorado first had a 10% renewable mandate, then it got up to 20, and now I believe it's at 30, and we don't get credit for pushing it that far down the line. The starting point is here, while other states started here. Right, and have we would have been, we'd have been better off if we had not invested in renewables all this time. It would be a lot easier to meet this mandate than it will be now. So the idea that this can somehow help the economy when it really is going to put marginal households into poverty, into the poverty zone by, I mean, some, let's some talk estimates about the, let's show talk, this at five to $700 a year increase in utility rates. How does that help your economy? Yeah, let's, let's talk about the, the economic part of this. You know, uh, since 2004, our rates have gone up about 67% on electricity. Uh, and anybody who's, who writes the bill to Excel can certainly verify this. Tell me how this is good for the economy. And let's talk specifically about people in need and, and families. Yeah, sure. So couple of things of note. First is that the projections that the clean power plan is going to save average consumers money. Not a lot of money, but a little bit of money over the life of the phase out of coal fired power plants. That's the first projection. The you, you, believe, thing, you believe that one? Absolutely. The second thing is that the state has already taken a lot of cost effective actions that have and that will for over the long term reduce people's electricity bills in very substantial ways. So rates of increases were much higher in the early 2000s. Right now rates of increase for power are very, very low. A lot of that reason is because we've invested in very cost effective renewable and clean energy sources. So that's a, a second thing. The third thing is that the state has really shown that we can reduce carbon pollution by closing down old, dirty, coal-fired power plants and do it in a very, very cost-effective way. So if you look at the 2008 Clean Air, Clean Jobs Act, retired five coal-fired power plants, the net effect, the net effect on consumers' bills love, has been five cents a month. I love, five cents a month. I love the euphemism that we've retired them. No, we've had a corporate welfare push where an Excel uh, pushed a, a scheme to push for uh, forcing coal-fired power plants to work at a much cheaper uh, level so that they could build out new ones and, and capitalize those. But let's talk about, about, about the cost of these things. When we build this this new stuff and we're forced to do this you're telling me we're going to save money let me bring it over here that that this is going to save i mean this is this okay. this yeah. is bernie sanders talk <clears throat> this is this is this is hey we're going to have a wall and the mexicans are going to the pay idea for it. that it's going to save money is a bit of a pipe dream but it's based on the fact that in the through the clean power plan implementation of it we're going to make everyone's home so efficient that they use so much less energy that their bill goes down. So there's a big there's a big hill to climb between here and there. Somehow you have to get everybody's triple pane windows installed and and better insulation and all of the things that you could do to make a home that much more efficient. As far as uh, utility bills and where they are right now, that has a lot more to do with fracking than it does anything else because we've had a uh, we've had a, an energy revolution, a private sector energy revolution in this country that has sort of leveled off energy rates that otherwise would have been soaring at this point. Now, I would like to talk a little bit about the direction we're going in now that there is the stay and the governor's moving forward with this because we've had a bit of a sham of a process. 
to try to put this plan together. And so, I'd, you know, if we yeah, could... Yeah, what, the governor has announced that even though the Supreme Court says, no, this, this is questionable, we're going we're gonna to throw the flag on it. The feds can't force you to do it. Our governor uh, has said, damn the torpedoes, we're going to go do it anyway. He, he's the one who appoints people to the Public Utilities Commission, and they plan right. on going forward with it. And so he has the Colorado Department of Public Health... And by the Health way, and let's, let's be really clear, and Excel loves this, because right. then it, it, it all goes through Excel. Excel's become uh, a guaranteed uh, profiter from this. They add their 10% and off they go. It's, sure, it's, they can't it's the other electric organizations and like power the, companies. Those rural cooperatives and such, they don't, right. they don't love it. The governor has the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment moving forward with a process of all stakeholder meetings, they call them, meaning we're all going to get together and talk about the pros and cons of this thing. Now, if anyone... Anyone who has been to these meetings, and I'm surprised, John, that you're not on the panel, the expert panel, because the expert panel is stacked 100 percent. It's, it's full of people who, you know, sell things where they would benefit from the implementation of this plant. They are 100 percent in favor of it. Went to one in Commerce City, there were about 50 people in the audience, 30 of them spoke. 100 percent were in favor of the plan, and in fact, they wanted faster implementation of the plan. So uh, then they took the meeting out to Brush, where they got a little bit different reaction from the public. But still, you had an environmental club from a high school in Boulder, median household income about $75,000 a year, in Brush talking about how this was going to help people who live in poverty. It was going to help low-income minority households. Boulder's 90% white and has a $75,000 per year median income. Brush is 25% minority and has a $30,000 a year median household income. Yet it was the Boulder environmental students out there That's preaching over. why this would help poor people. I mean, I've, when I was on the RTD board, I, I know these, these type of um, Potemkin events. We go out and say, what kind of transportation do you want? And they all say rail because people who want to not have a tax increase are at home taking care of their families. Are these stakeholder meetings, are, are, are they representative of how ratepayers really feel about this? I think they're very representative. If you look what's happened at the federal level, the EPA held, held two years of hearings on the Clean Power Plan and got overwhelmingly positive comment from around the country. The state is saying we're going to hold a series of hearings so that we can hear from people throughout the state. They're going around the state. There's several of these meetings that are in rural areas, that are in and urban I remember the areas. same game. So I, I remember the same game when I was in this and that the people who are in favor of more government intervention show up. But the, I don't the think that's the issue. Really? I, I don't think that's the issue at all. I think the issue is there's very strong support for increasing investments in clean energy. If you look across the board in Colorado, over 77% of the public, all walks of life, support expanding solar, expanding wind, increasing renewable energy, and reducing carbon pollution. So there is broad support for these types of activities across the state and I, you just you then, can't then make why, that then up. why does it need to be mandated if our consumers well, want it exactly. All right, real fast last words okay. real, real fast well that does, okay the, the support you talk about doesn't mean they're in favor of this plan that the private sector has been providing solar arrays and wind turbines for years and will continue to do so uh, so I, I and, and there's a Magellan strategy scientific survey in Colorado if you ask whether they support this plan if it's going to raise utility bills at all 60 plus percent are against it. So I really don't think there is public last, support. Last word, this. why should the governor go forward with this plan even though his attorney general doesn't like it and I think a fair amount of his citizens don't like it? There are three reasons. Uh, acting on climate is an imperative. It is time that we take real action. The United States committed to real action in Paris along with virtually Colorado every other... never did. Virtually every other country around the world did. Colorado's been a leader and because of that, and the most important reason is we reduce air pollution, we increase health outcomes, we improve air quality, we improve the And I want you with a straight economy. face say that this is not going to impact ratepayers. It will in a very positive way. <laughs> but will it reduce pollution? 0.002% at best. All right. Remember that next time you write out your check to Excel. Stay tuned. You're going to like this.